If you have been wanting to respec and like optimize every companion character in your Baldur's Gate 3 party, but do it in a way that's both really powerful but also feels on point for that character thematically, then I think you're going to enjoy this video. Welcome to D4. Hey everybody, so here at D4, every week I take a deep dive into character builds for my favorite role-playing games. Usually that means Dungeons & Dragons. Lately, we've had a healthy heaping of Baldur's Gate as well, but I like to theorycraft about character builds, crunch numbers about them, not so that I can tell you the right way or the best way to play a certain character, but just to explore one potential way to build something that is both really fun but also really powerful to play. So if you enjoy creating characters for or your role-playing games almost as much as you enjoy actually playing the game itself, or if you're just looking for tips or ideas on how to build something that you're thinking about playing, then welcome home. This is where you belong, and I am so glad you're here, so thank you for watching. My name is Colby. Really quick, if you would be interested in getting a written step-by-step -step guide to help you recreate these characters or any of the characters that I build on my channel, without having to go back and rewatch the video or take notes, I'd appreciate it if you would consider joining as a channel member. There's a little button down there that says join. Um, for just a couple of bucks a month, you get access to the library of write-ups that I create for each one of these builds. And it's just a nice way to lend some additional support to me and to the channel. Huge shout out and thank you to all my channel members. You guys are fantastic. I could not do this without you. For everybody else, you are also fantastic. Just watching, liking, subscribing, commenting, clicking the notifications bell. These are also great ways to support the channel and so I thank you for doing any and or all of them. So yes, as I mentioned at the beginning of my last Baldur's Gate 3 video uh, right over there, a lot of you have been asking me to do like an optimized build for our NPC companions that feels like it's still true to their story and concept. I mean, sure, you could turn Karlak into a burst damage sorcerer if you wanted, and actually I've been guilty of doing that myself, but that might feel a little off for who that companion character is like supposed to be, right? And I mean, for some characters, making even a fairly mild change can be a little jarring. I can't imagine Shadowheart waxing nostalgic about the glories of the dark embrace of Shar after being respect to be a light cleric for example, as tempting as that may be. And so that is the goal for this video. Respec those companions to maximize their mechanical power while doing my best to stay true to like their story and background. To that end, I'm going to give myself these rules. They have to have at least as many levels in their original class as they do in any other class. And if we're going to change their subclass, it can't feel like too big of a departure from who they are and where they come from. That second rule admittedly will be a bit subjective, I know. And I might make some changes with some of these characters that you think are like too far off their intended path. I'm okay if we agree to disagree, but no, I'm not going to just commit necessarily to just using whatever their starting subclass is because the trickery domain sucks. <laughs> now, having conversations about a character's story might potentially get us into some spoiler territory. So whenever I feel like I might be flirting with even mild spoilers, I'm going to change the video to black and white like this and put up big floating text at the bottom that says spoilers like this. Once I'm done with any spoiler territory, we'll go back to normal and drop the text so you can just mute the video and wait until we're done and then see when we're finished. Cool. Let me also say this. Although the builds that I'm doing here are geared towards our companion characters, any and all of them would absolutely work great as a build for your own player character. People have been asking me to do a Swords Bard Pact of the Blade Warlock, for example. We'll get there today, but sure, you could use that build that I'm going to present for either your companion or for your tab. Have, right? One last and important note, I'm only going to plan on doing builds for the six origin character companions here. I know there are others that you can potentially pick up depending on conversations you have, quests that you do, namely, mild spoilers, give them a second to hit that mute button, Halcyon, Jahera, Minsk, and even Minthara. But I mean, 
I killed Minthara, and actually failed to do Halson's quest before it was too late in Act 2. And, you know, I'm sure a lot of us are in a similar boat, so I decided to just focus on the six that we're basically all going to have for sure. And also, and this is going to upset some of you, six builds is a lot of builds. I am just not comfortable trying to cram all of that into a single video, so yes. Sorry, I'm actually splitting this one up into a two-parter, with part two coming out next week. Doing the builds the way I like to with proper explanation and reasoning would just make for a super long video if I tried to cram all six into one, and while I appreciate that many, maybe most of you, would have no problem with, say, a 90-minute video, the YouTube algorithm doesn't seem to like it as much, and more importantly, my own sanity and work-life balance would suffer drastically from trying to get all of that done in a single week. So thank you in advance for your patience and understanding. Okay, preamble done. Let's jump into Baldur's Gate 3 episode number five, Optimizing the Companions, part one. But first, I am thrilled to have Obvious Mimic as a sponsor for the video yet again this week. Was game night canceled? Are you the forever DM at your table? Or do you just really want to test one of the characters that I've made on this channel in an actual D&D game? Maybe you're new to D&D, you've come to it from Baldur's Gate, you're curious about checking it out, but you don't yet have anybody to play with? Well, I've got some great news. Obvious Mimic makes D&D 5e solo adventures for anyone who wants to play more, or play at all, but might not always have people to play with. Or maybe they could just use a break from people for that matter. The Wolves of Langston was Obvious Mimic's first murder mystery solo adventure, which I talked about last time they sponsored a video a few months ago. I played it, it was so cool, and now they have just successfully kickstarted their second. It's called The Crystals of Zaleth, and it is currently available for pre-order. The Crystals of Zaleth is a classic adventure of exploration, discovery, and survival where you uncover the mysteries of a hidden city and, hopefully, live to tell the tale. Take your own path through an interactive story designed to replicate tabletop gameplay where your decisions have real consequences. Fight monsters, cast spells, and find treasure just like in a D&D campaign that you're playing with your friends with an original story that has real stakes. You make progress, you gain experience, level up, you even gain loot that if your DM were okay with it anyway, you could potentially bring to your actual tabletop game. Best of all, yeah, this would let you play all those character builds that, as a viewer of my channel, I know you've been dying to take for a test drive. So, check out Obvious Mimic at this URL, please. That's how they will know that I sent you. I will put a link to that in the video description, of course. And also, if you use the discount code COLBY at checkout, oh man, that's so sweet. <laughs> Usually my sponsors give me a D4 discount code. This feels a lot more personal. Anyways, say my name and you'll get five bucks off either the Wolves of Langston or the Crystals of Zaleth pre-order. So nice. So huge thanks to Obvious Mimic. I love what you guys are doing. And let's jump into those builds. I think we ought to kick things off with everyone's favorite goth princess, Shadowheart. I think of all the companions, Shadowheart might actually be like the most sensitive to subclass changes. I mean, I don't think it makes a huge impact on who Gale is as a character if you make him an enchanter wizard or an abjuration wizard instead of an evocation wizard, right? But I guess mostly due to the nature of certain domains and deities that they tend to worship, it's tough to make too far of a departure with Cleric when they already have a specific god that they worship. But the problem is, like I said, trickery domain just isn't that good. I mean, you can make it work, of course. And sure, there are some benefits to having bonuses to stealth and getting a little illusory duplicate to give people some small advantages, but I think we get a lot more out of other cleric subclasses. Now, I think my favorite mostly cleric build for this game, at least that I've come up with thus far, is the light cleric that I actually laid out in that last BG3 builds video, uh, number four. But yeah, again, that doesn't work all that well for a worshiper of Char. That said, spoiler warning, depending on how things play out for her at the end of Act 2, I think that you could totally respec her at that point into Light Cleric and feel great about the decision from a story and like redemption arc perspective, yeah? So if you decided to make the good girl decision there, 
like I did, then I would, I think, totally respec her into that light AOE cleric build that I did last time at that point. Okay, end spoilers. So what is our best option if we don't want to go light cleric or like a life cleric to be a fantastic healer? In order to stay true to Shadowheart's character, but we don't want to stay trickery because it's a lackluster subclass. Here's what I would do. Respec her to be the goddess of the storm. I think channeling anger and pain, the darkness of a thunderstorm, as a Tempest Cleric feels like a lot better fit for a follower of Shar than most other options. And Tempest Cleric has a lot of potential for big damage. So yes, the build that I'm going to present here does have a lot in common with the Wrath of the Storm build that I did in my third Baldur's Gate 3 video. But there's some major differences here that we need to incorporate in order to make it work as a mostly cleric build for Shadowheart. Generally, it's going to move the build from like a pure burst damage focused build to one with some decent burst damage potential, but better sustained damage too. Here's how. At level one, for our starting class, yeah, we're starting as cleric, of course. But then, as soon as you meet Withers, I would respec her. If for no other reason than to clean up those terrible starting stats. Make sure that you get her a 16 Wisdom, a 16 Intelligence, and a 14 Constitution. What's the deal with Larian giving like every single companion character a bunch of odd numbered stats to start off with? It's like they're just begging you to respect these characters. As for the 16 Intelligence, I'll explain about that later. At level one, clerics get their subclass, and like I said, we're gonna change it to Tempest. As a Tempest cleric, we get heavy armor proficiency, so we don't have to worry about our dexterity as much, which is nice. Eventually then, be sure to grab the best heavy armor possible and a shield. Not too worried about weapons here. As a Tempest Cleric, we get Wrath of the Storm. It's a nice little way to like return damage on an enemy attacker with our reaction. And then we get Cleric Spells. Tempest Clerics get Thunder Wave and Fog Cloud for free. Both are decent spells. But other than those, I'd say just go with the usual suspects here at level one. Bless, one of the best buffs in game, guidance, one of the best utility spells in game, healing word, one of the best healing spells in game, and then most important of all, create or destroy water. As a reminder, in BG3, when a creature gets the wet condition, then cold and lightning damage is doubled against them. They're vulnerable to it, right? There are several ways to cause a creature to get wet, throw a bottle of water at them or near them, for example, but another great and easy way is via the create water spell. It creates a nice puddle of water that can get multiple enemies wet. A couple of notes here. Casting the spell won't cause non-hostile enemies to suddenly attack you, so you can potentially set up combat by going into turn-based mode, casting this, waiting around, and then opening combat with your cold or lightning damage, if you know that you're going to be fighting those enemies. However, if the enemy is already hostile, it might be tricky to get Create Water off without starting combat and thus wasting your first turn because you got to get pretty close. Here's one potential way around it. Hide around a corner or behind a pillar or something and then upcast the spell if need be. The higher level you cast it, the bigger the area of water created. This can potentially let you get enemies wet without even starting combat and then you can engage the enemy with your lightning or cold spell for double damage without wasting that first round. At level 2, clerics get Channel Divinity. They get one charge of Channel Divinity, which resets on a short rest, and they can use this to either turn undead, right, and make undead enemies flee from you if they fail their save, or, as a Tempest Cleric, Destructive Wrath, which is our bread and butter burst damage ability, letting us do full maximum damage on a lightning or thunder spell instead of rolling for it. That's huge, especially if the enemy is wet, letting you do double max damage. It ends up being almost four times what you'd get on average without Destructive Wrath and the wet condition. Now, at level three, originally for that Wrath of the Storm build, I went with Storm Sorcerer levels to get access to Quicken Spell, among other things, so that we could throw out Create Water as a bonus action and then follow up with a Lightning Spell for Big Burst all in a single round. Or, if the enemy was already wet, cast two Lightning-based spells in a single turn. I'm going to adjust the Shadowheart version of the build for a couple of reasons. One, I don't want to invest three levels into another class, at least not right away, since I wanted to feel like mostly a cleric throughout. And that build, by the way, that I did ended up being mostly a sorcerer. I kept going, I wanted to get Lightning Bolt, but that was a five level investment and it meant I was making Charisma my main stat as opposed to Wisdom. And again, that doesn't feel very cleric-y or Shadowheart-y. <laughs> but another reason that I felt like I ought to change it for this build is because 
I've kind of learned that it tends to be a lot easier to get enemies wet before combat begins without triggering combat like I've explained, and or use an ally to toss a bottle of water. And we'll have a great build for an ally to be able to do that without sacrificing much, by the way. So Quicken Spell didn't feel quite as necessary. Plus, there are some really nice mechanical benefits to getting more cleric levels. That said, we don't currently have a good lightning-based damage spell, and we want one. Remember, wet doubles cold and lightning damage, and destructive wrath does max damage on thunder and lightning. So we've got to go with a lightning spell to take advantage of both, right? And the best level one lightning-based spell for damage is chromatic orb. So we need a dip into another class to get it because it's not available to clerics. But if we're not as worried about quickened spell, then I think instead of Sorcerer, I would grab a level of Wizard at this point to get Chromatic Orb, now that we've got Destructive Wrath. Frankly, Shadowheart has never felt particularly charismatic to me anyway. I mean, she can be pretty prickly, right? There's a bit of a wall there. <laughs> but intelligent? Cerebral? Calculating? For sure. So let's do a level of Wizard here to get access to Chromatic Orb instead of Sorcerer. Thus, as a Wizard 1, we would get Arcane Recovery, and that's a nice way to get some spell slots back. And then, yes, we get Wizard spells, so we get Cantrips, level 1 spells. Just make sure to grab Chromatic Orb, which will do, as a level 1 spell, 2d8 lightning damage, or other damage types if we really wanted to. Plus, with lightning, it will cause the ground and the entire puddle of water, if you have one and they're standing in it, to become a electrified for a couple of rounds, meaning enemies that touch the area get the electrocuted condition, which deals a little lightning damage to them every round for a couple of rounds. Plus, it'll knock them back when they're first trying to enter the area. So at this level, if we upcast Chromatic Orb as a second level spell, which we could do thanks to multiclassing two full spellcasters together, right? We've got second level spells. If the enemy were wet, and we use Destructive Wrath, we would hit for 48 damage on a single target at level three. Not bad. Of course, arguably the best reason to take Wizard here is because of this thing that a ton of you have been commenting about in my videos. I kind of feel like it's cheating, so I haven't talked about it thus far. I kind of feel like Larian is going to fix or patch this, but it's worth mentioning. At the time of this recording, at least, if you take a single level of Wizard, then you can permanently learn a Wizard spell from a spell scroll of any level so long as you have access to spell slots of the appropriate level, right? So for example, right now we have second level spell slots, but as a cleric to wizard one, we don't have any second level spells. Well, if you were to find a spell scroll of say, Misty Step, you could learn that since it's a wizard spell and have permanent access to that spell for the rest of the game. This is definitely not how it works in D&D. And like I say, I'm willing to bet that Larian is going to fix this in a future patch, hopefully not before this video comes out, but if it's working as intended, I mean, keep your eye out for those juicy wizard spell scrolls and get ready to scribe them into your spellbook permanently. Hello, a lightning bolt. Anyway, once we've got Chromatic Orb, let's go back to Cleric, I think. Feel free to get a second level of wizard to grab a subclass, but I would rather get more and better Cleric spells, plus some good Tempest Cleric options if we're not going to be trying to beeline for Lightning Bolt. So as a Cleric 3, we get second level Cleric spells. Tempest Clerics get Shatter and Gust of Wind for free, both situationally useful, some nice AoE damage on Shatter, and it's Thunder, so you could double it with Destructive Wrath, but it won't benefit from Wet. Beyond those free spells, go for the usuals here. Aid for a nice buff and heal, Lesser Restoration for a little cure-all, Spiritual Weapon if you you need a weaponized bonus action, not bad. At level 5, we would be a Cleric 4, and that means we get our first feat, and we are absolutely going to bump our Wisdom to 18 to make our spells harder to resist and hit more regularly. At level 6, we would be a Cleric 5, and that means we get Destroy Undead. This causes Turn Undead to also do 4d6 damage in addition to trying to turn them, right? Which is nice. And then we get third level Cleric spells. Now, Tempest Clerics get Sleet Storm for free to make a big ice patch and forced casters to make a concentration check, which is nice. But then, best of all, Call Lightning. This spell is typically only available to Druids and Storm Sorcerers and is really 
fantastic for this build. I think I overlooked it when I was first creating this character, because in D&D it's a good spell, but it's not great. But in Baldur's Gate 3, it's stronger, and we have things like the wet condition that doubles lightning damage, so it's a really fantastic spell. It's great for both burst and sustain damage. So the spell requires concentration, and then it calls down a lightning bolt that affects creatures in a pretty small two meter or seven foot radius. It's big enough to hit two targets if they're standing somewhat close together, otherwise you're probably just going to be hitting one with it. Now, that initial strike does 3d10 damage, but then, again, so long as you maintain concentration, each round thereafter you can continue to call another lightning bolt down for the same effect by just using your action to do so, not spending any more spell slots. 3d10 damage every turn at the cost of your action and your concentration is situationally decent, but if you can easily get targets wet, and now we're talking 6d10 in an AoE every single round, with a massive wallop of 60 flat damage if you use Destructive Wrath, that's pretty fantastic. Now, in D&D, when you upcast this spell, the initial lightning bolt does an extra d10 of damage for every level above third that you upcast it at, but in Baldur's Gate 3, it continues to do the increased amount of damage every single turn when you upcast it as well. Yeah, this spell is really good in this game and especially for this build. At level 7, we would be a Cleric 6, and that means we get to use Channel Divinity twice per short rest. And this is one of, if not the biggest advantages that a mostly Tempest Cleric has over, say, a Storm Sorcerer or Tempest Cleric. Being able to use Destructive Wrath twice per combat encounter, assuming you're taking short rests after each fight, right? That's some massive burst damage capabilities, especially when we're using a spell like Call Lightning that we only have to use one single spell slot for, right? Tempest Clerics also get Thunderbolt Strike here, which lets us push enemies up to 10 feet when we do lightning or thunder damage. That's a lot of fun. It will be super useful a lot of times in order to keep enemies at bay or yeet them off cliffs or maybe back into your electrified water, etc, etc. At level 8, we'd be a Cleric 7 and we get 4th level Cleric spells. Tempest Clerics get Ice Storm and Freedom of Movement for free. Ice Storm is like Sleet Storm, but it does cold and bludgeoning damage in addition to making a big ice patch on the ground. And Freedom of Movement is a nice concentration-free buff that gets allies out of stunned and keeps them from being slowed or restrained or paralyzed. All right, it is at or about this point in the game, where I personally would consider respecking Shadowheart into a Light Cleric, depending on how things go for you, what decisions that you make, but you don't have to, regardless of the decisions that you make, right? And if you don't, sure, at this point, feel free to grab some Sorcerer levels so that you can Quicken and Twin Spell, or go back to Wizard to get, I think, the Evocation subclass so that you don't have to worry about hurting your allies with your AoE spells. We've probably found a Scroll of Lightning Bolt at this point, or sure, even just stick with Cleric to pick up more and better Cleric spells and features. Any of those options are good ones, and regardless, you are going to love playing this version of Shadowheart. I've respect her to this build in my game, and it is so fun. All right, on to the second build for the week, Karlak. Ah, uh, Karlak, my favorite companion. It's too bad Larian didn't give her a little more story, right? Because her personality is just the best. She's so awesome. And I think for her star to burn brightest, pun intended, we need to just channel her inner berserker barbarian and let her wreck stuff. And so, to that end, this is what I would consider to be the ultimate Karlak barbarian build. At level one, starting class, Barbarian, then let's respec those ability scores to a 17 strength, a 16 constitution, and a 14 dexterity. For equipment here, we're going to be looking for thrown weapons, medium armor, and any equipment that adds damage to thrown weapon attacks. Because yes, we are making Karlak a raging thrower, and it's going to be glorious. So, as a Barbarian 1, we are going to get Rage, which we can use twice per day for now, as a bonus action to get an extra 2 damage on melee, improvised weapons, and thrown weapon attacks. Very nice. We also get resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage while raging, and as I'm so fond of saying, that is most of the damage that we will be taking in-game, so that's wonderful. Just keep in mind, the big drawback to rage is that we can't concentrate on or cast spells while raging, right? No worries, 
we don't need them. We do also get unarmored defense at this level as well, which lets our armor class be equal to 10 plus our dexterity modifier plus our constitution modifier. But most of the time, that's still going to be a lower armor class than if we just had some good medium armor. So until you find some really stellar, like barbarian specific non-armor armor, just go with regular armor. At level two, we get danger sense, which basically gives us advantage on dexterity saving throws. And then we get what is, in my mind, and the Barbarian's best feature, Reckless Attack, which just straight up lets us have advantage on our attacks at the cost of giving enemies advantage on their attacks against us. It's totally worth it, especially if and when we're raging, so we'll have resistance to most of the damage that we're taking anyways. Now, here's the tricky thing about Reckless Attack on this build. It's only supposed to work on melee attacks. Unlike in D&D, when it's on strength-based attacks. And thrown weapon attacks are not considered melee attacks, right? However, currently in the game, if you make your first attack on the round with Reckless Attack turned on, then all the rest of your attacks that round will still have advantage, even if you're throwing stuff. That's going to be really useful on particularly hard to hit enemies especially, but we are shortly going to have such a huge buff to our hit chance that I'm not going to miss advantage quite as much on this character as I do on other builds. If you decide that you don't want to like make a melee attack first and then start throwing. At level three, first up we get a third rage charge per long rest and that's actually a pretty big deal, letting us rage just about every fight if we're short resting after each combat and then long resting after three fights or so, which is kind of the norm for me. It seems to be what most people are doing based on what I'm hearing and seeing. But then, yes, Barbarians get their subclass at this level, and yes, we are totally going with Berserker. Super fitting for a hot-headed, barely keeping it under control sometimes, frenzied fire goddess. Ooh, is it getting hot in here, or is it just me? <laughs> so, Berserkers don't get just regular rage, but frenzied rage, which tells us that, when raging, we can make an improvised weapon attack with a bonus action, which is nice actually, but then also we have access to two new abilities. Frenzied Strike, which lets us make an additional attack each round with our bonus action. That's great, but it comes with a pretty hefty price tag of giving us a stack of Frenzied Strain. Frenzied Strain gives us a minus one to hit for each stack of it that we have on us, and those stacks don't go away until we stop raging. So yes, we're gonna wanna use this with caution as it can quickly get our hit chance down to an unacceptable level in a long fight. The other new ability that we get is our bread and butter ability for this build, enraged throw. This tells us that we can basically use a bonus action to throw stuff. That can mean something lying around nearby or something already in your inventory that we have equipped. It can even be an enemy standing nearby that you can pick up and throw. But there are some additional benefits here. If we hit our target with enraged throw, they have to make a strength save or they're knocked prone. That's awesome. But also, at least currently in the game, it's adding our strength modifier twice to the damage if we're throwing an actual thrown weapon. I'm assuming this is a bug, but either way, it's a big damage bump and it makes using thrown weapons here a really great idea. So stack up on javelins and hand axes and daggers, or better yet, find the returning spear that's for sale early on in the game in the goblin camp that will just return to you automatically every time you throw it. One other thing that may or may not be a bug with Enraged Throw. Currently, using it also adds a stack of Frenzied Strain, though the tooltip in the game doesn't say that it will. What's worse, if you pick up another creature and use them to throw at the enemy, something that's both potent and hilarious, as it does damage to both the one you're throwing and the target you throw them at, and can knock both of them prone. But when you do that, it actually puts two stacks of Frenzied Strain on you. So I would only do that that with enraged throw if you had like one enemy that only had a hit point or two left and you wanted to kill them by throwing them and do some damage to the enemy that you're throwing them at yeah but at level four we get our first feat and yeah the thing that really makes this build shine is that tavern brawler feat that we would take here this feat is arguably the most overpowered feat in the game at the moment bumping our strength by one to a nice even 18 and then telling us that when we make an unarmed strike an improvised weapon or a thrown weapon attack then we get to double our strength bonus for both our hit chance and our damage 
And yes, for those counting, that means that if we enraged throw with a thrown weapon, we're going to be tripling our strength modifier for the damage when we hit. What's more, the rage damage seems to be getting doubled here as well. So until they patch this out, if they patch it out, enjoy that crazy damage. And yeah, with such a high bump to our hit chance, it makes Frenzied Strain hurt a lot less. Especially if we can get advantage via Reckless Attack by maybe making a melee attack with our action, then using Enraged Throw for our bonus action. Though, to be fair, you might just be better off throwing with your action too. Doing so will still at least double our strength modifier in damage thanks to Tavern Brawler. It won't triple it because Enraged Throw is only usable as a bonus action, right? But it's still really good. So choose wisely. At level 5, Barbarians get fast movement. That gives us an extra 10 feet of move speed when we're not wearing heavy armor. Always welcome. But more importantly, we get extra attack here so that we can attack twice with our action, potentially making a reckless melee attack, and then enrage throwing with our bonus action and just doing a boatload of damage on our turn. But at level 6, it's time to leave Barbarian behind for greener pastures because, yes, we want some rogue levels now. As a rogue one, we get expertise first off. This lets us double our proficiency bonus for two skills of our choice. And if it were me, I would take perception for sure, as I think it's the most used skill in the game. And probably athletics to just make Karlak that much better at things you need a good athletic skill for, jumping, shoving, etc. We also get sneak attack here, which lets us do extra damage once per turn. It's a d6 for now. If we make an attack with a finesse or ranged weapon, if you have advantage or the enemy is standing next to one of your allies. And while no, thrown weapons aren't the same thing as ranged weapons, there's one weapon I can think of that has both the thrown and finesse property, the dagger. And yeah, in my testing, when I had advantage and then threw a dagger, it applied sneak attack. In fact, when I was testing it, that throw that I made crit and ended up doing 37 damage with a single bonus action thrown non-magical dagger, and then it knocked him prone. So yeah, it might be worth keeping a good dagger on you to take advantage of sneak attack here. At level 7, we would be a rogue 2, and that means we get cunning action so we can dash, disengage, or hide as a bonus action instead of an action. Always useful. And then at level 8, we would be a rogue 3, and that means we get our rogue subclass, and you know what we're doing. We're going thief. And this is the main reason that we came rogue, right? You knew that. Because thieves get fast hands, and fast hands lets us take two bonus actions every single turn, which is just insane. And that means, for us, two enraged throws every single turn. And enemies are just going to melt under all that thrown weapon deliciousness. Don't forget, just in case we are throwing a dagger once in a while, sneak attack does scale at this level too, up to 2d6. From this point on, level 9 plus, after we got Thief under our belt, I'd probably go one more level of Rogue to get another feat and then get our strength up to 20. And then I think I'd actually go Fighter for those last three levels. Not only would that get us Action Surge and a nice fighting style, but you could even, at Fighter 3, take the Eldritch Knight subclass and Eldritch Knights in addition to learning some handy wizard spells, get this cool little feature called Weapon Bond, which lets you magically bond a weapon, any weapon, so that when you throw it, it automatically returns to your hand. So now, if you find a thrown weapon that's better than something you already have that was like an automatically returning weapon, well, now that new weapon can be a returning weapon too. And that is just mwah, perfect. All right, for our final companion of part one, we are going to dive into Will. I know, I know, you all wanted Asterion. Well, too bad. You're gonna have to wait until part two for your favorite trampy vamp. I can't put all of the favorites in part one. Part two is not gonna get as many views as is. Part two of two-parters never do. Right, so, Will. Honestly, I think Will might be the easiest of all the companions to do a super awesome and optimized build for that is 100% on point for him thematically. Everything we need to know is in his moniker, the Blade of the Frontier. So at level one, yes, Will starts out as a warlock and of course we're keeping him that way, but then we're going to make sure to respec his ability scores to a 16 charisma, a 16 constitution, and a 14 dexterity. As for equipment, just look for the best rapier 
here that you can get, a shield, and the best light armor you can find, though we will be swapping that out for medium later on. Warlocks get their subclass right at level 1, and there's no need for us to change will from fiend. Minor early spoiler warning, it wouldn't make much sense for us if we did anyways, since his patron is, well, a devil, or half devil anyways. As a fiend then, Will gets Dark One's Blessing, which gives some temporary hit points whenever we kill a creature, not bad. And then as for warlock spells that we get here, fiends get Burning Hands and Command for free, both situationally useful, but beyond that I'd make sure to grab Eldritch Blast, that best offensive cantrip in the game warlock staple, as well as Hex for a little extra damage on your target when you hit them with either a weapon attack or a spell like Eldritch Blast. It's perfect for us. At level 2, we get Eldritch Invocations, and there are two must-have invocations for this build. Agonizing Blast is going to add our Charisma modifier to the damage of each beam of Eldritch Blast that we fire, and remember, it starts firing two beams at character level 5 and then three at level 11. And Devil Sight is going to let us see in magical darkness. You know where I'm going with this, don't you? At level 3, Warlocks get their Pact Boon, and we absolutely have to go with Pact of the Blade. Let's make Will actually represent his nickname, right? Pact of the Blade is fantastic in BG3. It lets us either bond our equipped weapon as a packed weapon or lets us summon a magical packed weapon of our choice. And afterwards, if we make attacks with that packed weapon, we can use our spellcasting modifier both to hit and to damage. I love being sad, single ability score dependent. So now we can just focus on our charisma and have it benefit both our spells and our weapon attacks. Hooray! Also, importantly, at third level we get second level warlock spells, and that means that we can get, among other great options, the darkness spell. Now, in my very first BG3 video uh, over here, I talked about how this wasn't working properly in early access, but whether it was or not, they fixed it for final release, and I love it. Darkness is both stronger and weaker in BG3 than it is in D&D. On the one hand, in Baldur's Gate, you can't cast it on an object, only on the ground, meaning that you can't, like, cast it on your weapon and then have the darkness move around with you. But, just like in D&D, in Baldur's Gate 3, if you have Devil Sight and are inside that darkness, then your enemy can't see you, but you can see them. So you've got advantage on attacks against them, and they have disadvantage on attacks against you. This is fantastic, but what's even better is that if you're in the darkness, and an enemy outside of it is trying to attack you with a ranged attack, the attack just straight up fails. Like, there's not even an attack roll made. It's as though the thick darkness is impenetrable to missiles. They just bounce off. Doesn't work that way in D&D, but it's great for this game. Now, the area of darkness itself is smaller in BG3 than it is in D&D, but I actually see that as a good thing. It makes darkness a lot less disruptive for your other allies. So from this point on, I'd use Will like this. Cast darkness on your first target, and then on subsequent turns, make rapier attacks against them with advantage, enjoying relative safety in the meantime since you're inside that warm, dark embrace. Once any and all targets inside of the darkness are dead, just stay inside as best you can, firing out Eldritch Blast Beams from within, enjoying continued advantage and safety, picking off your targets one by one. It makes Will feel like a true spell sword, super gishy. You're both making weapon attacks and casting spells, and it's awesome. At level 4, we get our first feat, and as sad as we are, we are 100% bumping Charisma here to 18 to benefit pretty much everything we do. Now, alternatively, we could do something like, say, take the Great Weapon Master feature and then make our packed weapon a great sword or something, and enjoy that plus 10 to damage at the expense of a minus 5 to hit. If you're using darkness and getting advantage, it's not a bad idea. The big problem with going that route, I think, is that, again, darkness doesn't travel with you. So after the enemies inside it are dead, you're going to have a much tougher time hitting your enemies, unless you're getting advantage from some other source. If you are, and you'd prefer to make Will more blade than caster, go for it. For me, I think I keep it simple here and just leave him in that darkness. It's just a lot of fun, conceptually, to run in, make melee attacks against enemies inside that darkness, and then just stay there firing out beams from within. At level 5, in Baldur's Gate 3, Warlocks get Deepened Pact, which strengthens our Pact Boon, and gloriously, in PG3, that means our Pact of the Blade grants us extra attack, and that's perfect. We also get a third invocation at this level, and I think I'd probably go with Repelling Blast here so that my Eldritch Blast can knock enemies back 10 feet. You don't always need that turned on, but 
you can toggle it on and off and having the option to knock back is super fantastic when you've got great reason to be pushing your targets off of things or into things, or if nothing else, away from you or a squishy ally. And we love Warlock level five because we also get third level spells here now, and fiends get both Stinking Cloud and the Illustrious Fireball as options for some nice AOE damage, but you could also grab a strong control option like Fear or Hypnotic Pattern. I think I'd be sure to grab Hunger of Hadar as it's unique to Warlocks and it makes a big 20 foot radius of blackness on the battlefield that does damage and blinds and enemies inside and causes the ground to be difficult to rain. So it's just a nice way to make a bunch of enemies miserable if you can get it on them. But at level six, it's time to leave Warlock behind because you see, there's more to being the blade of the frontier than just killing things with sword and spell. Any old adventurer can do that. What makes the blade the blade is the stories that grow up around this folk hero right? And what class excels at embellishing grand stories that the common folk can look to and receive inspiration from? The bard, of course. So yes, we're taking bard levels here. And honestly, I feel like doing so is way more on point thematically for Will than just staying straight warlock. I mean, come on. Look at the way he's always trying to like charm and sweet talk your other party members during those like passive conversations that they have with each other, right? As you're running around the world, the guy is probably more bard than warlock. He just accidentally got trapped into a raw deal with the devil. Anyway, as a bard one, then we get first up bardic inspiration. This lets us three times per long rest, as opposed to charisma modifier times per long rest in D&D, use a bonus action to inspire our allies. They then have a d6 that they can add to an ability check, an attack roll, or a saving throw of their choice in the next 10 minutes. It's a fantastic support ability that makes everyone better. We do get bard spells here as well, and I'm just gonna say pick your favorite. Vicious Mockery, unique to bards, is a fun one cantrip to do a little damage and cause an enemy to have disadvantage on their next attack roll if they fail their save against it. It's worth using once in a while, if for no other reason than just to see the awesome lines of dialogue that get shouted out when you cast it. They're hilarious. I'd probably grab Healing Word for some emergency healing, maybe Fairy Fire to give you advantage outside of your darkness, especially if you went the Great Weapon Master route, but yeah, nothing otherwise that I'm going to plan on using regularly in combat, so PYF. At level 7, we'd be a Bard 2, and that means we get Song of Rest, which is way better in BG3 than D&D, as it just straight up gives us a third short rest per day, which is always handy. We also get Jack of All Trades, which is just such a great feature, especially for like our main PC character, I think, since it just adds half of our proficiency bonus when we're making a check with an ability that we're not proficient in. At level 8, we would be a Bard 3, and that means we get our Bard subclass, our college. And as the Blade of the Frontier, of course we're going with College of Swords. We can't but go with College of Swords here, and it's a fantastic subclass. First of all, it gives us medium armor proficiency, so go ahead and grab your favorite medium armor now. Then we also get a fighting style, but there are only two options available to Swords Bards, dueling and two-weapon fighting. Since our packed weapon can only apply to a single weapon at a time, we're going to be sticking with a single rapier here, and so we'll take the dueling fighting style, giving us an extra two damage with each hit that we make with that rapier. Nothing crazy, but a nice little bump. More importantly, we get Blade Flourish at this level, which functions kind of like battle master maneuvers. We essentially get to spend a use of our bardic inspiration now, if we wanted to, not to inspire our allies, but to enhance our weapon attacks in one of three ways. These are quite a bit different than they are in D&D. Defensive flourish is nice, it makes a weapon attack, but then if it hits, it both adds your bardic inspiration die in damage, and then increases your armor class by just a flat four until your next turn. It's not bad, but it does have to hit or you get no AC bump. Mobile Flourish pushes your target not 5, but a whopping 20 feet away if it hits. That's kinda crazy. And then after you push them, it lets you just teleport to them without having to spend a reaction or a bonus action or anything. Slashing Flourish maybe got the biggest bump from its D&D counterpart. It just acts like a full cleave. It lets you do damage to two separate targets. And now, here's the thing. Like in D&D, in BG3, you can use these flourishes on ranged weapons, but here, since it just like lets you make two attacks against enemies within range, if you're using a ranged weapon, you could just target any second enemy that's within range of your ranged weapon. They don't have to be standing next to each other. And yeah, I mean, if you have the sharpshooter feet, that's kind of crazy. Feels a little broken, but maybe it's working as intended. If so, I'm sure I will have a ranged swords bard built out before too long. We also get second level bard spells here, and while there are a ton of great ones, 
Cloud of Daggers, Hold Person, Crown of Madness, Lesser Restoration, Invisibility. There's nothing I'm necessarily planning on using during combat, sticking probably with Darkness or Hex for concentration, depending on how hard our enemies are to hit. So go ahead and pick your favorite. At level nine, we would be a Bard four, and yeah, I think at best if we just bump that charisma up to 20 here to make both our weapon attacks and our spells more potent. If you went Great Weapon Master last time, you might wanna consider taking Polearm Master here once they fix the feet at least, so that you can make a Great Weapon Master infused bonus action attack with the butt of the polearm, right? It leaves us with a 16 charisma all this time if we went that route, so I'd probably advise against it unless you've got some gear that's increasing your charisma or at least your hit chance significantly. But yeah, at the time of this recording, polearm master's broken. It doesn't apply the extra damage from great weapon master, even though you're using that same two-handed weapon to make the attack. It really should. I hope Larian fixes it. If not, it's not a great feat for this build. At level 10, we would be a bard 5 and that means we get improved bardic inspiration. This tells us that our bardic inspiration is now a d8 instead of a d6, nice little bump, and we also now get four of them per rest instead of three. But better yet, we get font of inspiration, which resets those bardic inspirations on a short rest now, meaning lots more flourishes, among other things, and that is wunderbar. But yeah, this is the level that just keeps on giving because we also get third level bard spells here. Hypnotic Pattern and Fear are probably the best options for some strong control if you didn't grab them as a warlock. And the nice thing about pairing bard and warlock here, of course, is that both use charisma as their spellcasting stat, right? So our bard spells are gonna benefit from that charisma just as much as our warlock spells do. Anyway, pick your favorites here, take the ones that you think are best. And then at level 11, we would be a bard six, and that means as a swords bard, we finally get extra attack. Wait a second, we already had extra attack from Pact of the Blade, right? That's correct, we did. But again, as of this recording at least, extra attack from Pact of the Blade actually stacks with extra attack from other sources. So maybe it'll be patched out soon, maybe by the time this video comes out. But if not, enjoy lots of attacks on your turn now with three attacks when you use your attack action. Speaking of three attacks, at the exact same time, level 11 here, Eldritch Blast will now fire three beams. So regardless of whether you're making weapon attacks or beam attacks, you get three of them with your action. So good. For level 12, just pick your favorite class. <laughs> I mean, you could go back to Warlock to get the Dark One's own luck feature from Fiend Warlocks, which just lets you add a d10 to an ability check once per short rest. Not bad from a utility perspective, but Bard 7 would get us 4th level Bard spells, and I think that's the better route here. That said, I'm not necessarily dying to have any of those 4th level Bard spells, though they're all useful. Greater invisibility is worse than it should be, unfortunately, since it forces you to make an increasingly difficult stealth check every time you cast a spell or make an attack while you're invisible instead of just straight up letting you stay invisible. So yeah, if you're looking for advantage, just stay in your darkness. Dimension Door though is a great way for a big teleport for you and a friend. Always nice to have in your back pocket. Polymorph does not let you turn your best friend into a T-Rex like it does in D&D, &D, but it still can make your enemy a sheep. Wait, what is this? World of Warcraft? <laughs> Anyway, pick your favorite fourth level spell. And that is it for the Blade of the Frontier. Going this route makes Will a fantastic Gish, I think. So if you love Gishes, feel free to use this on your own character as well. I'm confident that you'll love it either way. But that does it for this week's video. I hope you enjoyed it. I really hope that you'll turn in next week to part two, where we will dive into Asterian, Lazel, and Gale. I love you guys. Thank you so much for all that you do for me, for this channel. I hope you have a fantastic day and a really great week. And if you don't, hang in there. But I hope that you will also be kind and stay safe and that I see you again very soon. But until then, take care. Spread the news Cause there's an angel in Manhattan Call out the paparazzi and the television crews And me I choose Would a little faith come to harm me? Print the headlines up in the New York Daily News It was just another day 
like any other other day, a Tuesday afternoon. <laughs> Ellis Paul, anybody? He's a good one. A nice kind of folky, mellow musician. I'm feeling that today. I'm feeling a little folky, <laughs> a little mellow. Mm. Mm. Hey, check out the silver play button. I'm so excited about it. I can't not display it, but I don't really know where to put it. I got rid of the fern, but that just feels a little awkward. I don't know. Interior decorators of the world, let me know. Where does this thing need to go? If it's like, I can't, I don't want to put it back there. It's going to like reflect that light too much. I don't know. Maybe I'll just leave it where it's at. If you use the discount code, if you use the discount code, blah, blah, if you use the discount code, <laughs> hmm. the AC just came on. Can you guys hear that? I have a feeling the mic's going to pick that up. Oh. I can't turn it off though because then I will boil. Sorry about the background noise. <sighs> Time for part two. But I can't just like do it in the exact same shirt with the exact same hair. I gotta make it seem like it's a different day. <laughs> I could just... Nah. <laughs> oh, I know. Go like this. Oh, shoot. What should we do? How about a nice like like yellow orange yeah there we go that works that works with the maroon tea i think there we go totally different day 